Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grand Rounds. <clears throat> Again, um, we're doing per this Grand Rounds predominantly virtual, but for those that are in attendance, welcome. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Chris Ryerson. Uh, Chris is a respirologist who has special training in interstitial lung disease and is going to talk to us today about the new guidelines and approaches for the diagnosis and management of interstitial lung disease. Chris. All right. Um, thanks, Barry. Uh, you guys can hear me okay online? Yeah. All right. Great. Um, it's a, a sparse crowd um, so far. Um, there's there's one person in the audience here, so hopefully more people will show up. Um, so I was going to talk about uh, new guidelines and approaches for the diagnosis and management of ILD, um, so interstitial lung disease, which mostly be focusing on pulmonary fibrosis, so the fibrotic subtype of ILD. Um, I have a few disclosures, which I'll just I'll flip through. Um, so we'll talk about some recent clinical practice guidelines uh, focusing on idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and hypersensitivity pneumonitis, uh, summarize some of the recent major ILD clinical trials. And then uh, if we have time at the very end, um, we'll get to some of the, the more nuanced uh, details of, of how we approach pharmacotherapy now for progressive pulmonary fibrosis, which is sort of the new frontier of ILD. Uh, so as a little bit of background, uh, ILD used to be simple. Uh, patients without a clear presentation um, or a CT scan would then have a surgical lung biopsy. The pathologist would tell us what they had. We would say, okay, and then everybody would get steroids all the time. Um, and now we, we take a much more nuanced approach to ILD management. Um, and we have a, a whole bunch of different, more complex scenarios. So things like hypersensitivity pneumonitis, uh, but with no exposures. Um, we have things like a UIP pattern in young women uh, that would be relatively incompatible with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And then things like uh, NSIP patterns, uh, which is a specific pattern, but seen in a lot of different etiologies. And sometimes we can see clear exposures um, with an NSIP pattern, and we're not too sure what to make of that. Uh, and some of the issues leading to these problems include sampling error, uh, inter-observer agreement or disagreements among pathologists, uh, and then the lack of really integrating clinical and radiological data. Um, and now the diagnosis matters because we do have treatments that are a little bit more targeted to the underlying biology. Uh, so for those of you that have been around for a couple decades, um, ILD classification, the contemporary approach really starts in 2000 uh, when there was an ATS ERS guideline on the diagnosis and treatment of IPF. Um, so this was focused on IPF specifically, uh, which was defined as a specific form of chronic fibrosing interstitial pneumonia limited to the lungs and associated with a UIP pattern on surgical lung biopsy. Um, so that's in 2000. 2000, uh, in that, that initial guideline, uh, there were these somewhat horrible major and minor criteria for the diagnosis of IPF, and you had to have all major and three out of four minor criteria. And this is historically interesting because we, we do nothing like this anymore. Uh, it's totally different. So this has been abandoned since then. In 2002, uh, this was a, a broader document looking at interstitial, idiopathic interstitial pneumonias, or the IIPs, um, suggested that um, bronchoalveolar lavage and transbronchial biopsies were less helpful in fibrotic ILD, added idiopathic nonspecific interstitial pneumonia as a provisional diagnosis, and produced this, this diagram here. Um, that provides a bit of a, an overarching approach to ILD classification. Uh, and you can't see this, but there are some idiopathic interstitial pneumonias here. Um, there are uh, diffuse parenchymal lung diseases of known causes, things like drugs or connective tissue disease, granulomatous things like hypersensitivity pneumonitis, and then some other rare things. So that was back in 2002. And we're still using this general approach um, these days, uh, more or less. In 2008, there was a document on idiopathic NSIP, uh, which was now defined as a distinct form of idiopathic interstitial pneumonia. This is a classic CT scan um, showing lower lung predominant ground glass, traction bronchiectasis, and some subpleural sparing. This um, is a frequent radiologic pattern, but to see it idiopathically is quite uncommon. So even in this selected cohort, uh, there were only 17 cases that they were able to come up with that actually had bona fide NSIP, um, idiopathic NSIP. Uh, also in 2008, this was, I think, one of the most helpful documents that I looked at as a fellow. This is a Fleischner glossary of terms for thoracic imaging and reviewed just about 100 different um, uh, 
uh, findings and patterns, uh, mostly on chest CT scan. Um, so if you're a trainee, this is still, I think, the, the best documents to look at from an imaging perspective. Um, in 2011, uh, this was the more contemporary approach to IPF. Um, so this now was defined in a similar way, but allowed for a radiologic pattern of UIP to be used for the diagnosis of IPF. Uh, and this, um, uh, this allows us to get away without doing a surgical lung biopsy in a large proportion of patients. Uh, there was more of an integration uh, between CT and biopsy. Uh, and I'll come back to this table in a little bit, but there was this complex table of um, what you see on CT scan versus what you see on biopsy and whether you can call something IPF or probable IPF or possible IPF or something else. Um, and this was an improvement, although there's still some problems with this. Uh, and I'll go over that in a little bit. Uh, and then in 2015, there was an updated guideline on the treatment of IPF. And this was based on these three clinical trials I've just shown the title page here, um, showing benefit of nintedanib and profenadone in patients with IPF. Um, so these were, were all published in 2014 um, with this guideline coming out in 2015. So that brings us to, to the present day um, very quickly. So ILD classification, this is how I approach it um, from an ILD perspective. So um, if you have a diffusely abnormal CT scan, I think of four main patterns on that CT scan from an ILD perspective. And those include fibrosis, ground glass opacification or consolidation, which I grouped together, multiple nodules and multiple cysts. Um, and just as an example, some images of each of those things. So these are quite distinctive uh, overall patterns uh, comparing across these four categories. Um, and this is how it gets a little bit more complicated. So within the fibrotic category, there are more specific patterns like UIP and NSIP and HP patterns. Uh, and then within each of those, there are more distinct clinical diagnoses that are listed uh, mostly in blue here uh, with IPF highlighted in red. And you can see that there's um, breakdowns uh, subcategories for all four of these uh, overall patterns um, and really long lists, literally a couple hundred different things that could be put on this page. Um, so to, to come back to this document, this is again a 2008 document, really this is the, the way that we approach classification now because it's really based on the CT scan. Um, so some of the, the, the documents that people will read about the, the little black book or blue book or red book, whatever it is, the pocket book um, that people carry around, uh, these days approaches ILD classification in a quite unhelpful way, talking about uh, whether you know the etiology or don't know the etiology. And that's not really helpful because when you're first approaching the patient, you don't necessarily know the etiology. Um, so I think approaching it from an imaging perspective is really where you start. And, and this document is what helps you get started. So to go through a few of the, the key features from a fibrosis perspective, the three main things that we look at are honeycombing, reticulation, and traction bronchiectasis. Uh, and there are nice examples here of honeycombing looking like a beehive, usually in the lower lung, subpleural regions, reticulation, which just means lines of scar tissue that usually run adjacent to or extend perpendicular from the pleural surface. And then traction bronchiectasis, where you see the airway bigger than the accompanying blood vessel or non-tapering airways. So these are the three hallmark features of fibrosis on a CT. Um, this just illustrates a high resolution versus a standard resolution CT scan, just showing that you really do need that high resolution and sharp contrast and edge detection to, to better characterize ILD. Uh, the inflammatory features, again, ground glass and consolidation. I won't spend too much time on this, but this is a, a nice example of ground glass where you can see the underlying lung architecture through the abnormality, whereas consolidation, you lose that underlying architecture, but you can still just see the air bronchograms. Uh, this is a UIP pattern, uh, so again, characterized by lower lung predominant peripheral reticulation, traction bronchiectasis, and honeycombing, um, classically seen of IPF, um, but also can be seen in connective tissue disease and hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Um, this is an acute exacerbation where you see superimposed ground glass. Um, so the same type of honeycombing, but with this area of ground glass superimposed. And these are pretty horrible events when they happen with about a 50% mortality within the next three months for, for a patient like this. Um, likely even higher if they come into hospital with this. Um, to contrast with an NSIP pattern, this is again peripheral and lower lung predominance, but you often get this rim of subpleural sparing, which is a really helpful distinguishing feature from UIP when it's present. 
And you typically will see a mixture of inflammation and fibrosis, inflammation being manifested by this ground glass appearance, so this hazy opacification, um, in addition to the reticulation um, and traction bronchiectasis that's more characteristic of the scarring. If you see this, really suspicious that this is a connective tissue disease. You can also see this with drug exposures and, and other environmental exposures occasionally. And the last main fibrotic ILD I'll mention is hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Um, so this is characterized by multiple different distributions. So it can be upper, mid, or lower, or diffuse. Um, you can see fibrosis. Um, you can see med, uh, features of inflammation, like I've shown you. And then you can also see air, areas of, of airways involvement. So things like gas trapping or mosaic attenuation, which are these areas of relative lucency um, that you can see scattered throughout here. Uh, when you see these areas of, of lucency uh, with areas of ground glass and then areas of normal lung density, we call that a three density sign, which is pretty specific for HP. Uh, with, with one rare exception of connective tissue disease, you can see that as well. And then these are just a few images of some pathology patterns. Um, so a UIP pattern with a nice fibroblastic focus here, an NSIP pattern with sort of lace-like abnormalities throughout the lung, LIP where you see a lot of lymphoid follicles, and then follicular bronchiolitis where you see this inflammatory, um, uh, uh, inflammatory cells around the, the bronchioles, uh, which would be most suspicious of a connective tissue disease. So the way that we, we approach this now, we integrate the clinical features, um, so their exposure history, connective tissue disease features, uh, with their imaging features, and then the pathology, if we do a biopsy, we discuss things and come to a consensus diagnosis. To simplify this though, um, the way that we've, we've approached this in the past and really up until now, is that you either have IPF, um, you have something else, um, or you're unclassifiable. Um, and the reason that we approach that is historically the treatment has really been dichotomized um, as whether you have IPF or a non-IPF ILD. If you have IPF, we treat that with antifibrotic medications. And these are the same three clinical trials I mentioned before, supporting the use of nintetinib or perfenidone for IPF. Those are two antifibrotic medications. And then we use immunomodulatory or immunosuppressive medications for all the non-IPF things. So that would be things like connective tissue disease or hypersensitivity pneumonitis, um, with mycophenolate generally being the preferred option, um, giving us the best balance between efficacy and side effects. Um, so there's a long list of things that we can use here. Um, but again, mycophenolate being the preferred prednisone sometimes in the more acute setting. Um, just to give a quick snapshot, I won't go over these trials in any detail, but perfenidone and nintetinib, these are the two antifibrotic medications. Uh, and essentially what they do is they slow the rate of lung function decline over time. They don't stop it, but on average, they reduce lung function decline by about 50%. Um, these are, are two figures that uh, they may be a bit small on people's screens, but um, these are over the span of 52 weeks showing placebo in the lighter uh, curve. Um, the treated patients with perfenidone or an intetinib in the darker curve showing about a 50% reduction in the rate of FVC decline over time. We also know um, from a study in 2012 that prednisone, azathioprine, and NAC are harmful. Um, so this is um, kind of the opposite. So this is time to death um, and showing that if you're treated with these things, you have a much higher uh, rate of death compared to placebo. Um, so these drugs actually kill people with IPF, and we don't use those um, for long-term management of IPF any longer. Most of the harm seems to be associated with the higher doses of prednisone that were used early on in the study. So why did we need new guidelines? So the last few years have, have brought us uh, a couple of new guidelines that I'll go over in detail, but um, why did we need these? And there are four main things that I think of. So number one is that surgical lung biopsy is risky. Two, we've got some evolving approaches to ILD diagnosis. I've touched on a couple of those. We have some new tests, um, some of which are available here and some of which are coming along, uh, and then new treatment approaches that we'll, we'll finish the talk with later on. So for a surgical lung biopsy is risky. Um, so this is the rate of in-hospital mortality after a surgical lung biopsy for patients with interstitial lung disease. This is based on a, a very large uh, kind of claims database from the United States showing on average over a decade and a half um, or a decade and a bit that you have about a 6% risk of dying in hospital after a lung biopsy for ILD. So one in 16 patients or so would die after that biopsy, which is horrendous, of, of course, um, and something that we would probably never really refer a patient for something that has a one in 16 chance of killing them. 
if you split it up into non-elective versus elective, it looks a little bit better. Um, so elective patients, these are the people that I would see in clinic, say, I don't know what's going on, let's get a lung biopsy. And if you average this out, it was a 1.7% risk of in-hospital mortality for an elective uh, surgical lung biopsy. And there's a, a study from Europe uh, published the same year that shows the exact 1.7% uh, risk of in-hospital mortality as well. So that, that raises a question of why would you ever send somebody for an elective procedure um, to, to make a diagnosis for a medication that only slows progression. Um, but it does get a little bit better than this, perhaps. And this is a, an interesting editorial that went along with that paper um, that looked at all the previous cohorts that have been reported um, to have complications after biopsy. And about a third of studies reported no incidence of mortality after biopsy. Um, where you've, you've got some others over here that are getting up to 15, 10% uh, risk of in-hospital mortality. These cohorts are probably, um, these ones over on the right side, are probably being taken from critically ill patients um, who are studying uh, uh, patients who are, are not really um, elective biopsies or, or maybe patients who are being biopsied who just really shouldn't be biopsying. So the point here is that if you're um, being careful about your patient selection, surgical lung biopsy can still be quite safe. Um, so I, I typically avoid lung biopsy if you have any of these kinds of things. So older age, um, on oxygen, uh, low DLCO, although I think our threshold is getting higher and higher for that one. Uh, pulmonary hypertension, uh, very high or very low BMI, and then significant other comorbidities. And if you have none of these things, generally surgical biopsy is a, is a safe thing, um, recognizing that uh, um, you still have to minimize the need um, in, for doing this. So some evolving approaches to ILD diagnosis. This is getting into um, things that are a little bit more respirology fellow um, specific and, and even ILD fellow specific. Um, but uh, just very quickly, we're lousy at diagnosing some ILD subtypes. And this little figure here is, is taken from a, a study from Simon Walsh in the UK, published five years ago or six years ago now, showing that basically people can't agree on a diagnosis of idiopathic NSIP or hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Uh, and so we, we have poor agreement on those diagnoses, and that really relates to a lack of, of consistent and standardized understanding of what these things are and not having diagnostic criteria for those two entities in particular. We do better at, at IPF and connective tissue disease, though. Um, we have some potential new diagnoses. This is a research statement uh, proposing interstitial pneumonia with autoimmune features as a distinct clinical entity. This is a diagnosis that essentially is a respirologist saying your ILD is due to a connective tissue disease, um, but uh, we don't have enough features to confirm that based on a rheumatology assessment. So it's a way of me saying, yeah, you've got a connective tissue disease, even when the rheumatologist disagrees with me. Um, and that's probably a, a, a real entity um, because the connective tissue disease criteria are often somewhat limiting. Um, and then I mentioned idiopathic NSIP a few times and how rare that is. If you have a, a cohort that is um, a little bit loose in how they apply that, that term, uh, they'll have a 10 or 20% risk of, of NSIP or idiopathic NSIP. I will account for about 10 or 20% of their population. If you look at our Canadian cohort, which includes several thousand patients now, um, we have a less than 1% uh, rate of, of idiopathic NSIP or, or prevalence of idiopathic NSIP. So it's a quite rare entity if you're applying strict criteria like we've been doing. And then we have an increased ability to, to determine pretest likelihood. So I've mentioned a few of these terms. So we have patients with a, a CT scan that shows a clear UIP pattern on one end um, and then a clear pattern of something else on the other end. And we're pretty good at each of these extremes um, historically, but this is a really a spectrum. And we're getting better and better at pulling out some of these patients along the spectrum uh, who do have a UIP pattern and can get away without having a lung biopsy because their pretest likelihood of confirming that UIP pattern on biopsy is high enough that we don't want to take that risk. So all these things have evolved a, a little bit over the last few years. And we have some new tests. Um, cryobiopsy is one. Um, we're hoping to start this in Vancouver at some point, although um, starting something like this during a pandemic is challenging. Um, cryobiopsy, essentially you do a bronchoscope. Um, it has a, a, a freezing probe um, or a cryoprobe. Um, you can see the frost on it here. Basically it freezes the surrounding lung tissue and then you yank it out. Um, and because it's frozen, 
you get a larger sample and you preserve the architecture uh, of that tissue better. Um, you get smaller samples than a surgical lung biopsy. And so this diagram on the left shows that compared to surgical lung biopsy in orange, you move from being confident um, to being modestly confident. Um, but you still end up having the same overall conclusion in the end. When you put everything together with the clinical diagnoses, you still end up calling things pretty much the same thing in the end. Um, so there are some limitations of this. Um, there are some technical challenges, um, but uh, that's probably something that's coming to us um, in, the, in the next few years, probably, um, that will be safer than surgical lung biopsy. And then there's this thing called the, the molecular classifier or genomic classifier, which is available in the States at this point and FDA approved, but not yet approved in Canada. Um, essentially, this is a, a test taking lung tissue, um, applying this proprietary algorithm and coming up with this genomic classifier score that classifies patients as UIP or not UIP um, based on a bunch of different genes. Um, this test, I won't go through this figure, it's a little bit complicated, but essentially it has good specificity for a UIP pattern and poor sensitivity for a UIP pattern. So if you see that it's a UIP pattern on this test, that's helpful. And it eliminates some of that inter-observer variability that pathologists are, are unfortunately known for in the ILD world. All right, so the new guidelines. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, both IPF and HP guidelines. So I'll start with the IPF one. Um, and this, this document is, is sometimes a bit of a pain to read. Um, the intent of it is to help clinicians make an accurate diagnosis of IPF and then implement some recommendations. And they'll go through those recommendations in a sec. Probably the more helpful part actually is um, some of the details on CT specifications and surgical lung biopsy technique, uh, which were provided in in pretty good detail in this document. And then restructured some of the approaches to classification of CT and biopsy patterns. Um, and then, as I mentioned, perform or produce some recommendations on when to perform what tests. So I've, I've mentioned these terms before, but this is again a UIP pattern, same thing that I mentioned before. So lower lung predominant peripheral reticulation, traction bronchiectasis and honeycombing. Probable UIP pattern is essentially the same thing, with, but without the honeycombing. Indeterminate is when you really throw up your hands and you don't know what's going on. And then an alternative is when you have something that's really suspicious of some other diagnosis. And this is a classic case of hypersensitivity pneumonitis, again, with that three density sign and air trapping on an expiratory CT scan. So these are the four main categories that we apply from, a, uh, from an imaging perspective, um, with the pathology really being the same four categories, but really just from a, a biopsy perspective. And I've just shown the one UIP example here um, where you see this temporal or spatial heterogeneity, dense fibrosis, fibroblastic foci, um, and the absence of, of a lot of inflammatory cells. I won't show you the other categories from a, a biopsy perspective. And then there were eight clinically relevant questions um, on diagnostic decisions with recommendations. And there was a lot of debate about this and, and some of the uh, some of the issues uh, with this relate to the, the precise wording um, and the details of these questions. And I can go into that a little bit later if people wish. Essentially, you, you had a 70% agreement in the direction of recommendation was required before you could make a recommendation. And the recommendations were phrased as either we recommend if it's a strong recommendation or we suggest if it's a weak recommendation. Um, so as an example, um, for patients with newly detected ILD of unknown cause, um, suspected of having IPF, have a pattern, a CT pattern of probable UIP indeterminate or suggesting an alternative diagnosis, we suggest, um, so low confidence or a weak recommendation. Um, so we suggest surgical lung biopsy um, for those patients. Uh, for patients who have a pattern of UIP on CT scan, we recommend not performing a surgical lung biopsy, essentially because that UIP pattern on CT scan is good enough um, that you're you're not going to um, find something different on a surgical lung biopsy if you were to do one. Um, and these were the voting, so um, strong for, weak for, weak against, and strong against. Um, so you can get an idea of, of how these, these questions were approached with this. Um, this is a bit of a, um, a difficult slide to work through. This is a summary of those eight questions. I show this mostly just to highlight um, that there were questions about bronchoalveolar lavage, surgical lung biopsy, transbronchial biopsy, um, so through a bronchoscope, transbronchial lung cryobiopsy, 
these were the four main diagnostic tests that were that were discussed. And essentially, there's a dichotomy between UIP and non-UIP. So if you have UIP, basically, you don't need to do any of these tests. Um, UIP on CT scan is good enough to call it UIP on biopsy without needing to do that biopsy. If you have any other pattern, um, generally, it's recommended that you do these tests. And generally speaking, you, do a, you would do a BAL first, potentially, um, and then move on to surgical biopsy or cryobiopsy, um, depending on your local expertise. Cryobiopsy, there wasn't quite enough evidence at the time of this guideline, but nowadays um, this would be a recommendation for either a cryobiopsy or a surgical lung biopsy, whichever one you're, you're doing more locally. Um, so this is the, the more helpful algorithm. Um, so just to walk through this patient with suspected IPF, do you have a cause or an associated condition? If yes, um, then you have a specific diagnosis that's something else. So connective tissue disease or hypersensitivity pneumonitis from the birth that they've had in their bedroom for the last two years or something else. Um, if you don't have that suspected cause, um, then you look at the CT scan pattern. If you have a UIP pattern on CT scan, essentially that gives you a diagnosis of IPF. If you have one of these other patterns, um, then you need to do a multidisciplinary discussion and then consider either a BAL or a surgical lung biopsy and then have a discussion again and come up with a diagnosis of either IPF or something else. Um, there are some issues with that. I've just I've listed these here for people who are interested. I won't go into too many of the details um, for that right now. And then this is what, what you come out with at the end um, if you have a CT and a biopsy. So a CT pattern over here, UIP, probable UIP, indeterminate or an alternative diagnosis. Pathology pattern, same main categories, and showing the integration of, of these um, radiological and pathological patterns to come up with a diagnosis of IPF, a probable diagnosis of IPF, or in a determinate case, or something else. The, the more helpful way of thinking about this, though, is that if you have a UIP pattern, you don't need a biopsy. Um, if you have a probable UIP pattern, we actually know a little bit more than we knew at the time of the guideline that we don't really need to biopsy patients who are older and who are men who have a probable UIP pattern. Um, that was covered in fine print in the guideline, but probably one of the bigger oversights of that guideline. Um, we probably don't need to biopsy patients with a probable UIP pattern most of the time. Patients with indeterminate or alternative diagnosis patterns suggested on CT scan, we generally do need to biopsy those patients to make an IPF diagnosis, although we may not need to make a, not need to do a biopsy if there was some other smoking gun like um, uh, connective tissue disease or features suggestive of HP. Um, so what about those other things that I mentioned? So this is a breakdown of our Canadian registry. And again, a few thousand patients in this now. And you can see that connective tissue disease is actually the number one cause of ILD in our cohort with IPF being number two, unclassifiable number three, and then HP being number four. Um, and this is uh, geographically specific to some extent. Um, I'll show you an example in a different country where things are, are almost uh, opposite. Um, I mentioned this before, this is that study um, out of the UK, um, again, showing that um, we have really poor agreement for a diagnosis of HP and idiopathic NSIP when different people are looking at the same patients. So if we look at the kappa between different uh, multidisciplinary groups, for NSIP, we have a kappa of 0.25 or so. Um, for HP, a kappa of 0.24 to 0.31, depending on how you're looking at that. Um, which really suggests that we have very, very poor inter-observer agreements on whether to call a patient HP um, or idiopathic NSIP or some, something else. But those two diagnoses are, are really poorly agreed upon. Um, this is a study out of India. Um, and I'll, I'll show, um, I'll just focus on the, the top one here. So this is a study out of India, but patients were assessed in the Seattle ILD clinic with Ganesh Raghu, um, who's a well-known person in the ILD world in Seattle. Um, and these patients from India, about half of them had hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And this is almost certainly environmental related um, due to the types of living conditions um, that people had and the exposure to um, things like mold in the home, um, moist, uh, damp, uh, and damp climates. And you can see much smaller proportions of connective tissue disease and IPF. And again, the NSIP thing that I mentioned before um, being more common here when you're applying looser criteria for this. Um, so HP is a much bigger problem in other parts of the world than in Canada. Um, this highlights again, the inter-observer agreement or lack of agreement for patients with HP and idiopathic NSIP. So 
this is um, Ganesh basically assigning a diagnosis out of Seattle. Um, same patients given their diagnosis from the National Coordinating Center uh, in India, which is an experienced ILD center. Patients down the diagonal in green uh, were aware of Ganesh and the, the Indian center agreed on the diagnosis. And I just highlighted anything over the count of 10 um, showing that basically patients with HP or patients with idiopathic NSIP, that's where we're seeing most of the disagreement. Uh, and largely between uh, HP and IPF uh, and idiopathic NSIP and a variety of things. So this brings us to the, the diagnosis of HP, which was covered in a couple of recent guidelines. And I'll show the one from the American Thoracic Society, although there's another document from the, the um, chest, uh, American College of Chest Physicians. So HP used to be categorized as acute, subacute, or chronic, uh, based largely on the timing of symptoms. Um, acute being a few days, subacute being a few weeks, maybe a couple months, um, and then chronic being longer than that. And this was somewhat arbitrary. Uh, and morphologically, it was quite difficult to distinguish some of these categories from each other, and specifically the acute from the subacute ones. And then there are multiple studies showing that really it's the presence of fibrosis that drives progression and prognosis. So the new approach now is you either have non-fibrotic HP or you have fibrotic HP, um, with there being some patients who seem to transition from one to the other over the span of many years. So as, a, as an example, from an imaging perspective, this is a non-fibrotic case of HP. This is a patient who had a down exposure um, and has this diffuse central lobular ground glass nodularity. Um, this is a patient with fibrotic HP, again, that three density sign mixed in with features of fibrosis. Um, and this is a very classic CT scan finding for fibrotic HP. Um, one of the interesting things in this document, there was literally two and a half pages of this list of different things that have been associated with, with HP. Uh, we often simplify this to birds, farms, molds, and hot tubs, um, but there's a very, very long list um, of different types of exposures. I won't go into any of those details. Um, there's some helpful CT scan findings that are covered in this document. Um, so things like mosaic attenuation, air trapping, mosaic perfusion, and a three density pattern. These were terms that had been thrown around, but not really standardized. Um, and people meant different things when they were talking about mosaic attenuation um, versus air trapping versus mosaic perfusion. And so this document helps define some of these terms and a little bit more um, consistency. Um, for non-fibrotic HP, um, I'll just give you a quick taste. This is categorized, subcategorized as typical or compatible uh, with HP. So typical would be um, features of infiltration or inflammation uh, mixed in with small airways disease, HP being a small airway disease. Um, so this is a typical pattern where you've got both of these things together. Compatible uh, would be things that could exist, but you lack that specificity of having both of these things. Fibrotic HP is somewhat similar. Um, so typical HP, you have to have fibrosis plus small airways disease. Um, compatible, um, these are essentially fibrosis plus some modest small airway disease. That's not that specific. And then indeterminate is this really big grab bag uh, that really just means that anything can be HP. Um, so there isn't any, there are very few CT scan patterns that exclude the possibility of HP. Um, they're relatively specific biopsy features as well. So again, um, same, as oh, same as before, we have HP, probable HP, and indeterminate for HP. So there's a long pathology lists of, of features that you see in each of those categories. And I won't go into those details at all. Um, again, I won't go through this too much either. It just these are some of the tests that you think about in patients with HP. Um, and this was a bit of a frustrating process um, being involved in this guideline that basically everything was suggested as being helpful. Um, but in reality, we, we don't do, um, well, I don't do anyway, serum IgG, BAL we do sometimes, but not usually in fibrotic HP. Transbronchial biopsies generally aren't helpful. Cryobiopsies we don't have access to. Surgical lung biopsies we do uh, somewhat often for HP. Um, so there's a suggestion to do all these things, but there's a whole bunch of, of issues with each of these tests uh, that make it not, uh, not that helpful a lot of the time. So the way that we typically approach this um, is really HP is, is focused on the exposure assessment and the CT scan findings. Um, and if you have an exposure assessment and CT scan findings, you sometimes don't need to do anything further in terms of testing. 
Um, a lot of the, the people that carried the day in this discussion were from Europe, and in Europe, you do a BAL for everybody. Um, so that shows up prominently on this algorithm uh, that you do a BAL basically by default, no matter what. Um, if you have a BAL lymphocytosis, that's even more suggestive of HP. Um, and so that would provide you a high confidence diagnosis. Um, if your BAL is not supportive, then it's thought that um, this is an unclear diagnosis and you should be considering a, a transbronchial lung cryobiopsy or a surgical lung biopsy. Um, the, the way that this is approached from a, a terminology perspective and a classification perspective is really about diagnostic confidence, which is one of the ways that the field of ILD is going. And this is um, a, a document that we put together a few years ago, just providing some standardized terminology and approaches for this. And uh, essentially, if you're greater than 90% confident in your diagnosis, that's a definite diagnosis of, of that entity. Um, whereas you can have a um, a provisional diagnosis with high, moderate, or low confidence, or you can have unclassifiable ILD, which is defined really as the absence of a leading diagnosis. It's got a confidence of at least 51%. Um, so we'll use some of this terminology in the next slide here. So essentially what we do is we have our CT scan pattern, we have our exposure history. So if you have a typical CT positive exposure for HP, Right away, that gives you a moderate confidence in your diagnosis of HP. I would say that that's actually high or maybe even definite myself. I don't think the BAL adds too much in that situation, but um, I, I lost that discussion um, on the guideline. And essentially what you do is you work, work your way down this column or whatever column you end up in after your CT and exposure assessment, and you decide how far down do you need to go before you're happy enough to implement management. Um, if you're not happy, uh, you work down a column and essentially these tests get more and more invasive as you go and more and more specific as you go until you reach a definite diagnosis down towards the bottom. I would say that if you have a CT and an exposure, um, it, it would be somewhat silly to be doing a surgical lung biopsy in that situation, given what we know about the risks of lung biopsy. Doing a BAL lymphocytosis, I, I think if you see an absence of lymphocytosis, you're still going to call out HP and manage it as such anyway. So I don't find it as helpful. Um, so again, you start with the CT scan pattern, you look at the exposure assessment, and then you move down that relevant column. That, that's a, a reasonable way of approaching this from a diagnostic perspective. Um, one of the key um, summary points that I would make here is that there's multiple different ways to arrive at a diagnosis of HP. There's no individual feature that's mandatory and no feature that's pathognomonic. So it ends up being a difficult um, diagnostic criteria to implement. So the next frontier is progressive pulmonary fibrosis. Um, so there are a few synonyms for this. Um, respirologists will have heard PFILD or progressive fibrosing ILD um, or the progressive fibrotic phenotype. Um, this progressive pulmonary fibrosis or PPF um, abbreviation is gonna be the term that's used going forward though. And what this really is, is it's an artificial entity that implies a specific biology that's more likely to benefit from antifibrotic therapy. Um, typically, IPF is excluded, although it, it probably shouldn't be. Um, this is really just a pharmaceutical kind of um, uh, drive to, to make this classification, and maybe I'll explain what that means in a sec. This is just a classic example of a patient in 2018, 2020, and 2021 who had this progressive fibrosis um, that uh, you can fairly obviously see on CT scan. There are a number of clinical trials um, that have looked at this uh, population, often referring it to, um, to it as progressive fibrosing interstitial lung disease. But what these trials all did is they essentially took a group of patients who had something other than IPF, so a mixture of things like connective tissue disease or hypersensitivity pneumonitis or unclassifiable ILD or others. So non-IPF ILDs, um, but they essentially enriched their cohorts for patients who had progression and were at greater risk of future progression. And the way they defined that previous progression was a combination of worsening FVC um, in this first column, sometimes DLCO, worsening symptoms, worsening CT scans, and over variable timeframes. Um, and what, what they did essentially is created these criteria um, to enrich their study population so that they could justify use of antifibrotic medications in these populations. For that reason, they typically excluded patients 
Um, well, some of them excluded patients who were on immunosuppressive medications at that time, but most patients had been given the opportunity to be put on immunosuppressive medications and had failed um, those medications previously and had progressive fibrosis despite that. The way I define this is based on um, a combination of things. And I think of worsening CT scan or FVC as being um, sufficient. Um, so FVC that declines by more than five to 8%, um, the absolute FVC, um, I think would meet criteria or a clear worsening of the CT scan would meet those criteria. Um, or you can have more modest progression in multiple different domains, whether that's pulmonary function tests, dyspnea, or a CT scan. And of course, you have to have no alternative explanation. So this can't be worsening pulmonary hypertension or heart failure or something else. So if you meet those criteria, you have progressive pulmonary fibrosis, according to how I do it. So how common is this? Uh, it's quoted that all IPF is progressive, but that's not really true, um, especially with available therapies. Um, in non-IPF ILD, it's probably 10 to 50%, depending on how you define it. Uh, this is again from our registry. This is published last month uh, in the ERJ, European Respiratory Journal, showing that in the first 24 months of follow-up, about half of patients with uh, different ILD subtypes have criteria being met for progressive pulmonary fibrosis. So this is a very common entity um, if you follow patients for long enough. Um, so about half of patients overall. IPF and HP being a little bit worse than unclassifiable ILD, which is a little bit worse than connective tissue disease. Uh, this is looking at the outcome of progressive pulmonary fibrosis in a UK cohort, um, showing that patients with um, IPF in the gray have a, a poor prognosis over time. Patients who have other subtypes of pulmonary fibrosis who meet these progressive criteria have an outcome that's similarly poor to, to IPF. If you don't have this progression, unsurprisingly, you do better. All right, so how is progressive pulmonary fibrosis treated? So coming back to that historical dichotomy, um, the new data have led to an updated approach. Um, and I'll, I'll go through these clinical trials um, that have changed how we approach things now. So this is the in-build study, uh, which took patients with progressive pulmonary fibrosis, um, more than mild fibrosis on CT, pulmonary function tests in the mild to moderate range, uh, maybe bordering on severe, and then disease progression defined as either significant FVC decline or multiple um, milder worsening criteria. Uh, there were 663 patients. Um, about two thirds had a UIP pattern, um, a UIP or a probable UIP pattern, um, but the third did not. And patients got an antetonib or a placebo for one year. And this is a pretty typical cohort for patients with interstitial lung disease. They, they looked at a number of different uh, diagnoses here. So again, IPF was excluded, uh, but you can see a breakdown, all the things that I've mentioned all along, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, autoimmune conditions, idiopathic NSIP, unclassifiable ILD, and, and some others. And looking at the endpoint, the primary endpoint of FVC over 52 weeks, we can see patients treated with nitetinib had preservation of that FVC over time compared to patients who got placebo. So this drug worked in this situation of patients who were having progressive fibrosis. Uh, it worked in patients with a UIP pattern, um, it worked pretty well. In patients who had other non-UIP patterns, it still worked, but not as well as patients with a UIP pattern. Um, so maybe a bit, uh, a bit preference for us to use this drug in patients who have UIP-like patterns compared to those without. This is another study looking at perfenadone. So perfenadone is the other antifibrotic medication. Uh, this is when in unclassifiable progressive fibrosing interstitial lung disease or unclassifiable PPF. Mm -hmm. Similar characteristics to the previous uh, study in terms of the eligibility criteria. Um, so more than 10% fibrosis on CT, pulmonary function tests uh, in the mild to moderate range, um, and then disease progression, either uh, FEC decline or symptom worsening. Uh, this study was a bit smaller, 253 patients, um, perfenadone or placebo for 24 weeks. So it was a little bit shorter. Um, and the primary outcome was change in FVC measured by daily home spirometry over 24 weeks. And these were the, the baseline features. So similar to the previous study that I showed you. And this is a, a really interesting study that um, uh, really shows how important it is that you, you design your study appropriately and choose a good primary endpoint. So essentially they're home spirometry endpoints. So these are patients taking home a spirometer, blowing on the tube and coming up with a number. 
Um, there were technical reliability issues and physiologically implausible values. Um, so as an example, one person in the placebo group improved their FVC by 34 liters um, over the span of the study, uh, which is um, impossible. Um, uh, and so because of this, these outliers, they actually weren't able to do their primary analysis. And because of that, this ends up being a negative uh, study um, when you're applying those kind of strict methodology um, restrictions. So unfortunately, negative study um, because of these outliers. If they hadn't made that kind of bonehead decision in retrospect, um, if they'd just gone with doing a pulmonary function test in a hospital lab like we do in every other study that's ever been done, um, there actually was a highly statistically significant and a, a clinically relevant difference favoring the drug compared to placebo. Um, so all the, the secondary outcomes favored profenadone, um, but because of that primary endpoint issue, this ends up being a negative study. One interesting subgroup analysis is that patients who are on mycophenolate, which is a, the more common immune suppressive medication that we use. Um, so patients on mycophenolate did not seem to benefit. Uh, the benefit was exclusively in patients who were not on mycophenolate at baseline. And we don't know why that is at this point. Last study I'll mention is profenadone again um, in progressive pulmonary fibrosis um, other than IPF. Um, four different diagnoses that were included here, um, same types of enrollment criteria. This is a smaller study. It was terminated early because of recruitment challenges just before the pandemic started. And um, despite finishing early, um, the study showed um, that profenadone was again superior to placebo in preventing FVC decline and a few different ways of calculating this out, um, but consistent benefit of profenadone compared to placebo. So how do we treat ILD now? So I'll mention these six things, uh, which are, are obviously important, and I, I won't go into the detail because there's not too much debate about any of these things being beneficial. Um, but to move back to that dichotomy of IPF, you get antifibrotics, non-IPF, you get immunosuppressive medications. We now know that if you progress despite those immunosuppressive medications, there's good evidence um, for use of antifibrotic medications in that context. And nintendinib and profenadone, um, there's data suggesting uh, both or either of those medications is, is of, of benefit. So what the future of ILD treatment looks like, we, we've currently got an etiology-based approach to management. Um, that's again, IPF versus all the other um, ILD subtypes. And we're moving towards this morphology-based approach to management where we're going to use a variety of clinical, radiological, and pathological clues um, to suggest the likelihood of a treatment response to different types of medications. So I gave a bit of a hint that if you have a non-IPF ILD and you have UIP-like features on biopsy or on CT scan, they're the types of people that are probably going to benefit more from an antifibrotic medication um, compared to, um, to an immunosuppressive medication. Um, and I'll, I think I'll skip through this for the sake of time, but this is sort of how I, I'm, I'll, I'll maybe cover this very briefly. There are two stages of pharmacotherapy. There's a short-term treatment, usually with prednisone for rapidly reversible ILD, and then there's long-term treatment to slow future ILD progression. So from a, a short-term perspective, um, things like prednisone for patients who have acute or subacute worsening, lots of ground glass or organizing pneumonia on CT scan, lots of cellularity or organizing pneumonia on biopsy. And those are the people that we'll be giving prednisone to. Beyond that, there's a question of whether we observe, uh, whether we give immunomodulatory therapy like mycophenolate, or whether we use antifibrotic medications like nintedinib or profenadone. And there are a whole bunch of different clinical, radiological, and pathological features that would guide us to one of these three approaches. So I think that's how the, the ILD world will be approaching things over the next few years. And I, I'll, I'll skip these for the, the sake of time, but there are a few different um, features that would lead us down each of those. So in the near future, I think we'll be using both an etiology-based and a morphology-based approach to management. Um, and then the longer term future, which hopefully isn't too far away, is using more of a molecular-based approach to management. Um, and these would be um, you know, much more intelligent uh, molecular markers that are identifying the underlying biology and suggesting the most appropriate targeted therapy. So to summarize, um, there are some recent clinical practice guidelines for both IPF and HP. There's decreasing reliance on surgical lung biopsy and greater reliance on multidisciplinary integration of clinical, radiological, and laboratory features. 
about a third of patients, maybe a half of patients um, with ILD and referral centers will meet criteria for progressive pulmonary fibrosis, although with a lot of variability. If you do meet those criteria for progressive pulmonary fibrosis, then your outcomes are poor and comparable to IPF. Um, however, uh, with some evidence now that nintetinib and perfenidone attenuate that FVC decline, um, similar to the benefit that's seen in IPF. Uh, and then there's a bunch of uncertainties that remain uh, in the ILD world. So we don't know whether um, some patients should be given antifibrotic medications before uh, meeting criteria for progressive pulmonary fibrosis. So can we stave off that progression before it occurs? Um, or should some patients be given an antifibrotic before immunosuppressive medication? So what I was referring to at the end a little bit there. Um, and again, I think in the future, we're going to be using a variety of clinical, radiological, and pathological features to suggest optimal treatment. Um, although exactly how we approach that is going to need some further study and validation. And with that, I'll, I'll stop. And I think we've got five or 10 minutes for questions, if, if there are any. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, the one person clapping, I'm sure, is uh, clapping for all of us. It was a very you know, challenging. Yeah. Very uh, interesting presentation. Uh, before I open it up, I have a couple of questions. And what's the interrater reliability of making a diagnosis between uh, amongst radiologists and amongst uh, amongst pulmonary physicians? Because you're really talking about somebody who has uh, who's a patient who's come to, I guess, your clinic and the sophisticated uh, chest radiologist that uh, might be looking at it, but um, is, is this, a, is this a, is this, is there a regional center now that understands that everybody should be, the radiology should be sent to several radiologists in BC and, and subsequently, uh, the, uh, pulmonary physicians, or is this still, um, uh, yeah, up in the yeah, it's a great question. Um, so this study that I, I referenced before, this was based on, um, very experienced ILD centers in Europe. Um, and so even these very experienced centers were getting kappas in the 0.25 range um, for these diagnoses. So that's that's pretty shocking. Um, you you don't get anything better, and you certainly get worse um, if you go into more community centers or less experienced centers. Um, so this is kind of the the this is the best um, that we get. Um, if you look in the community, uh, there's much greater likelihood of calling things IPF uh, and much less likelihood of, of calling things anything else really. Um, and that's largely based on the radiology um, interpretation. Uh, when radiologists don't know what they're doing in a community practice, they call things UIP and therefore the clinician calls it IPF. In an academic setting, um, the radiologists call things that they don't know what they're, they're seeing, they call it NSIP. And the clinicians then say, oh, well, NSIP could be a whole bunch of different things. So I'm going to do a biopsy and, and get a little bit more confidence about stuff. So there's a bit of a, a dichotomy, I think, between academic and community. Um, we've, we've got an ILD multidisciplinary conference that we run weekly. Uh, and we see cases from our own clinics. But then we also have patients who are referred in from all over the province. Uh, and when we look at, at we did a, a publication a few years ago looking at that and about half of patients referred from outside institutions or outside respirologists, about half of those patients will be given a different diagnosis and a different treatment recommendation than what they came to us with. So it gives you a sense that there's a huge amount of disagreement um, and it's, it's worse in the community um, and it has clinical treatment implications. Uh, I'm going to ask one more question, then I'm going to, Dr. Uh, Tothill has asked a question, but is there, should, do you think, based on this experience and your, the, your clinic's experience, should all patients who receive a diagnosis, a radiologic diagnosis, should their radiology be sent to the several uh, radiologists that have, that are pulmonary radiologists to decide on further uh, for corroboration of that diagnosis? Is that something? Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. So I'd, I'd like to say yes, and that probably would be the, the best for the patient. I think we have resource issues, uh, which is partly why I skirted that question the, the first time you asked. Um, so I, I think if, if a patient is seen by a respirologist and they've got a connective tissue disease, it almost doesn't matter what the CT scan pattern shows, that's going to be due to their connective tissue disease. Um, so in those types of situations, maybe they don't need to, to have their CT reviewed again. 
or if it's a real classic um, UIP pattern on CT scan, the radiologist in the community says, so the uh, patient is an older male smoker and the rate respirologist, I think respirologists are pretty good at picking up the, the classic UIP pictures. That patient probably doesn't need to be reviewed either. Um, but then there's a whole bunch of other patients beside those uh, situations where it, it, it should be reviewed, I think. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, um, so Dr. Tothill said, uh, first of all, she enjoyed your presentation. Could you comment on the reimbursement for antifibrotics in non-IPF PPF? Yeah, I can, but you won't like it. Um, so essentially BC likes to drag its heels um, about reimbursement of new medications and they're doing the same thing here, I suspect. Um, Alberta just approved reimbursement earlier this week and they were the first province in Canada to do so. BC has had kind of all the documentation um, after approval by Health Canada um, probably a year and a half, two years ago, um, but there is no word yet on what BC will be doing. Some extended health companies are providing reimbursement at this time, and we've had one or two patients that we've managed to somehow ram through and get funding um, from the province, but um, it's, it's generally not, not funded at this point other than extended health coverage. Thank you. Um, last question on my part. What's the uh, downside? What, what are this, the untoward side, uh, um, side effects from the uh, antifibrotic medications? And why wouldn't you yeah. file everybody on those first? Yeah, so good question. So first of all, they're about $40,000 a year, um, give or take a little bit. So these are expensive drugs for now. Um, I've learned a lot about patents um, for medications in the last couple of years in Canada. And Surprisingly, the medications don't get all that much cheaper uh, when they come off patent. They, they get a little bit cheaper, but we're still talking tens of thousands per year, um, even off patent, uh, when we're talking about the generics. Um, in terms of the side effects, um, the two medications, propanidone and nintendinib, both are not tolerated in about 20 or 25% of patients, maybe even higher in some, some parts of the world. Um, the reasons that they aren't tolerated um, differ between medication. In tetanib, it's almost always diarrhea, um, sometimes weight loss, sometimes hepatitis. For perfenidone, it's fatigue, nausea, um, or skin rash, um, specifically sunburn. Um, and about a third, a third, a third um, of those for the patients that don't tolerate the drug. So it depends on the, the drug, but about 20 to 25% intolerance um, to either one. Thank you. Um, are there any other comments or questions uh, for Dr. Ryan? I have a question. Uh, being the only uh, audience <laughs> member, uh, yeah. it's Don, Don here. Thank, thank you um, for being here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you know, we're still in the COVID pandemic and there are, uh, you know, quite a number of post-COVID uh, patients who come to our clinic with CT-based uh, reticulation and query fibrosis. What do you reckon that these people actually have uh, you know, months in now years post uh, COVID, and uh, do, you know if they're truly symptomatic from it, do they need any therapy? Yeah, I think so. Uh, it's a good question. So we, I think there are two um, two situations, and maybe I'll, I'll come back to this um, this table. Um, so there's the early organizing pneumonia that we see, and clearly those patients. Well, I don't. I say clearly, but probably it's it's not as clear as, as it should be. We give those people prednisone um, to decrease that organizing pneumonia components. It's not really clear that that's helpful or whether that's just the evolution of the disease, but we do do this moderate to high dose, dose glucocorticoid therapy for a couple of months. And then after that, we're left with this kind of situation where you have to make a decision about no therapy, um, immunomodulatory or antifibrotic therapy. Those are really the three options we've got in the longer term. And generally the post-COVID patients fall into this category. Um, if you biopsy those patients, it's just a typical post-ARDS, um, post-DAD, um, diffuse alveolar damage some post-organizing pneumonia nonspecific fibrosis that you'd see. Um, but there is not really cellularity to that that would suggest you should be using immunomodulatory therapy. And they also don't have things like fibroblastic foci or things that would be more typical of a UIP um, progression um, being more likely. So we typically have just been observing those patients and they tend to improve gradually up to about a year afterwards. And then they plateau at that point. At least that's what happened with the wave one patients. 
who knows wave two and waves three, four, five, six, um, as we go to different variants, there's more upfront use of prednisone um, compared to before. We don't really know, but my suspicion is that those patients aren't going to progress longer term and we'll just be monitoring them. And unfortunately, they'll just have, have lost 10% or 20% of their lung function. That'll be that. Well, um, thank you very much, Chris. It's one o'clock. Um, I wish I could announce what next week's grand rounds are, but I don't know. <laughs> uh, please come uh, at 12 uh, th next Thursday for grand rounds. Thank you very much, Chris. Okay, thanks. Bye.